Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Data transfer objects, also known as DTOs, are like many things that get overused, used incorrectly, or worse, used in places where you don't even have the problem that they solve, specifically when you're mapping between layers and tiers. So what are data transfer objects really for and when should you use them? So let's start where I think people misuse or misunderstand DTOs and where things go wrong. So let's say we have a tier or a layer. This could be something that gets serialized on the way out or it's in memory, doesn't really matter. At some point, we're gonna hit some type of data access. We hit our database and if this is the case of an ORM, something in .NET like Entity Framework, you're thinking about retrieving an entity. And at this point, you could return that entity. It could be serialized back out to another tier, or if it was in process, in memory, to another layer. But that word entity can get people confused and lead them down the wrong path with DTOs. But before I get to that, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, Check out the link in the description. This is the first step of confusion because people are either thinking about two distinct things differently or kind of some weird merged idea. When you say entity, people are either thinking about in the ORM sense, possibly about an entity that really is just a data model. It's just the backing data model to your table that you're mapping with your ORM. Some other people are gonna be thinking about domain model in the domain driven design sense and thinking of about entity related to behaviors and the data. In either situation, what ends up happening is people then don't want to expose that data model entity or that domain model entity. And this is why they end up introducing some type of DTO. So we got our entity, however you want to think of that. And then you're mapping that to some DTO and that's ultimately when it ends up getting shipped down, possibly serialized to the other tier or just in memory to another layer. So the reasoning, which is valid in context, we'll get more to this, is that what you're saying is you don't want to expose the underlying data model to what is ultimately your database schema, or if you're thinking of the entity in the domain sense, that you don't want to expose your underlying domain directly to the caller. Rather, you want to do some translation mapping and then send that back to the client. Now I'm going to push back, give a little bit of food for thought and play devil's advocate, hopefully make some people think about the dogma around this. Why can you not return that underlying data model from your ORM or entity, however you view that? Why did you need to map it to a DTO? Speaking of dogma, let's give the example of an HTTP API, which I think is a great illustration of this dogma. So we have an HTTP API that oftentimes, in my prior example, our entity and the DTO we are creating that we are returning are almost always, in my experience, people are creating as a one-to-one. -one. They're identical. And this is somewhat of the reason why, is that you see all this related to how you build an HP API, all the tutorials about REST, which this is not at all, but you'll get claims that this is, is we're usually end up mapping kind of CRUD and behavior around databases to HTTP. So we got a get is a select, a post is an insert, a put is an update, a patch is a partial update, and a delete is a delete. So what you might end up is kind of this bike shedding around URI driven, driven development around methods. So if I wanna basically read, for example, let's talk about uh, shipping and shipping packages, deliveries, that type of thing. So if I wanna get a shipment, I call a get with a shipment and some ID a part of that URI. If I wanna create a shipment, I'm posting to slash shipment. Same thing for put, if for updating, patch the same thing and delete to delete a shipment. I call these entity services. Really what they are is mapping HTTP using JSON to a database table, just using regular CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, but it does force you down a certain path. And that path that's forcing you down thinking that you need to do CRUD operations on database records, a resource, how you're building a URI, it does not have to be a database record. It can be anything you want it to be. To illustrate this, if you're using server-side rendering, you'd be doing things a lot differently, and we kind of lose sight of that. If I was doing server-side rendering, I'd be getting all the data, and I'd be doing some type of composition to put it all together so I can produce my view, my HTML. I have my shipment number, when the shipment was started, the status, but I also have something like the customer. 
This isn't directly, I may have some reference to the customer, but the table, the actual entity underlying doesn't have the customer directly. I have to do that composition. As well as here, I'm illustrating, I have a couple different forms that I can do the arrive when the shipment needs to be picked up um, by the driver in the, the vehicle, as well as being able to cancel that shipment. But if you're using entity services and purely thinking about database records, this is something you would return. Just the shipment ID, the started date time, the status, not the customer information with the name, like in my other HTML view, but rather just the customer ID because you haven't done that composition, nor am I illustrating any of the actions you can perform like the arrive and the cancel. So what does this have to do with DTOs? Everything in my opinion, because there's two primary benefits. The first is managing coupling. The second is composition. So if you're not doing any composition at all and your database record maps almost identically to your DTO, in unfortunately worse, if you have more DTOs that you need to keep mapping all along the way, that means that when you make changes, you're making changes through all these different layers to all these different DTOs and they serve no value. The only value they might serve is the argument is, well, if I make a change to my underlying data schema, then I don't have to do it everywhere. That's fair, but you're creating all this work and all these DTOs when you don't even have that problem yet, which relates to managing coupling. If you're managing the coupling to your underlying data model and tightly controlling how that's being used, if you do need to change it, you're not in a world of hurt. Don't create work for yourself ahead of time just in case. It's about giving yourself options and not creating a bunch of work for just in case that can hinder you in future development. So if we're talking about CQRS as the example, we have a query and what it is is a special way of doing that data composition to return data specifically for that use case, that particular query. Our commands are exactly the same thing, but for use cases of providing some type of intent of we want to invoke something, we want to perform some type of action. It doesn't need to be a different database that these are using. It doesn't need to be a different schema. When people say they're different models, they're talking about the queries and the commands themselves and how you actually, they're performed and what they're underlying doing. It doesn't mean that they're using a different database. In the example what I was illustrating earlier, if you're talking about just strictly thinking about database records and I wanted to perform like the cancel of a shipment, what would I call the delete? Or when I did the arrive at the, the pickup where that happened, what am I doing? A put, like a patch, a partial put to update the, the data? No, you want to be specific about the actions, the tasks that you're performing and queries being specialized on doing that data composition. So with CQRS, our query, our response is really our DTO. It contains all that data composition. So if we were doing server-side rendering on the query response might be our HTML, but if we had an HTTP API, it's exactly the same thing, just a different representation because we've done all that composition. We have our shipment with all the standard information, but I'm also including the customer information as well as the same thing as in the HTML, I'm providing what the actions are, that we can cancel our shipment and do the arrive. This is the value of the DTO is in our composition. So a way of thinking about this, whether it be your API or whether you're using events or messages with an event driven architecture or messages within a queue, it's the same thing. You wanna be thinking about data on the inside and data on the outside. If it's inside, it's internal, it's private to you. You don't want to, you wanna be able to evolve it and change it without affecting external consumers. And if it's external, you wanna be thinking of it as public, as a contract, because you're gonna likely version it differently. And this goes back to the very beginning of the video where I kind of pushed back, food for thought and asked the question, do we really need to create that DTO? Can we not just return that entity? The answer really lies in what's the context? Do we own who is calling that, that consumer? Can we manage the coupling if we do expose it? If I find usages on that data model, that entity, is it two or is it 50? Well, if it's two, we've been managing it pretty well. If it's 50, maybe not. Another way I've been thinking about it is don't allow externals that you don't control to couple to internals that you do control. An easy example of this is just your database. It's internal, it's private to you. It's your implementation detail. You don't expose that to some random third party, but another layer within your application that you control isn't a random third party. You manage it. You can decide whether you want to couple to a DTO because that's what you want to interface with or whether you can actually manage and use that underlying data structure, data model, whatever it is. 
Do you have 50 references to it or do you have two? Don't create random DTOs that are a one-to-one -one mapping that ultimately just are still exposing whatever it is that you're trying to hide for no reason. DTOs have utility for dealing with things like composition and for managing coupling. Use them appropriately. And as always, get in the comments because I know you have some horror stories about layers upon layers where there's mappings upon mappings of seemingly the exact same object. So get in the comments and let me know your horror stories. And if you want to join my channel, the link's in the description. You can get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers about topics like this around software architecture and design. Link's in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or type of questions, make sure to get in the comments. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.